Hello everyone, uh, my name is Harish, I'm a PhD student here at UConn. As uh, some of you might know, I'm the TA for the course EC uh, 3111. So today I'm here uh, along with HKN to make a short video. And today we are going to talk about state space representation. And we are going to talk about how to do that for systems that are circuits. So we, I'm going to go over a couple of examples uh, in the hope that it will be really helpful for the upcoming homework. And for the students in the class, we are going to discuss more on this in the coming discussion session on Wednesday. So, let's take this first example here. As I said, we are going to talk about the state space representation today. So, a little bit of a uh, reminder. So, this is the generic state space representation, what we had here. So, we had x star is equal to ax plus du being the state equation, and y is equal to cx plus du uh, actually being the output equation. So, you should remember that this is a linear time invariant system, and this is the a state space representation of it. So given this system, we want to come up with a representation that looks like this, so that we will be able to represent the system mathematically. So this example, let's start with this example, and there is a first thing that you have to uh, do, that is the choice for state variables. So you have to come up with that decision. So state variables. So, looking at the system, there are two energy storing elements are here, an inductor here and a capacitor here, so which means you will require at least two states to define the system. So I'm going to define my first state as the current through this capacitor, and I'm going to call it, uh, sorry, through this inductor, and I'm going to call it IL, okay? And for the second state, I'm going to define it as the voltage across this capacitor and I'm going to call that VC, right? And as we all know, this is the input, voltage U, the source, and we are interested in this being the output. This was given to us. But the, these two variables were the choice we had to make, all right? So now, the question is, how do I come up with this choice, right? For different problems, I would have to come up with this choice. Sometimes it could be given to you, in which case it's easier, and sometimes it went on you. So you have to decide what could be the states. Obviously, this is not a unique choice. You could come up with different things. But there is a convention that if you follow, it will be really use useful. So if you can look at this here, what I've written is just simply the equations for the voltage across an inductor and current across the capacitor, right? So in this case, you can see that the current is being the one that's taken in the derivative, and we're taking the derivative of voltage here in the case of the capacitor. So conventionally, what we do is when we have an integrator, oh sorry, when we have an inductor, what we do is we simply take the current flowing through the inductor to be the state, and the voltage across the capacitor to be the state. The reason is, in a state equation, we always want x dot is equal to x plus v, which means we want the derivative at some point. Inherently, by definition, by physics, we know that this is going to happen. This is how you represent the voltage across an inductor, which means you would have to take the derivative of the current across the inductor. So I'm going to define that as a state, and always if I have a capacitor, I'm going to define Vc as a state. In this case, we have one inductor and one capacitor, so two states, one being the current across the inductor, and the other being the voltage across the capacitor. So as I said, this is not a unique choice, but this is a convention which will be really handy as we will see in a minute. So now, having defined this, we have to come up with a way to write the equations of the circuit. The very famous KCL or KVL could be used here. I personally prefer using the loop analysis or the voltage law because I think it's easier, but you could use both. So if I have to do it for these two loops, let's look at loop one, for example, to start, right? So in this case, I have the input voltage. That's always going to be there, U, right? And now I have, I have to write the voltage across the capacitor. So I'm going to pull all this down to this side because this is the source and everything else is, uh, is, uh, are the elements of the circuit that will consume voltage or there will be voltage drops across. So I'm going to write VL. I have to figure out what that is. And there is also this guy here. Um, I'm going to call this R1, right? So which means I need to know the R1. 
and that will be it, right? So this is the source, and these are the two voltage drops. These should be equal. We know that. Now, how do I come up with an expression for this? What is the voltage across an inductor? We go back to this formula. It is simply L times dIL by dt. We just define IL to be x1, in which case this will simply become dx1 by dt, which in shorthand is x1 dot. So I simply have L times x1 dot. In, in our case, we have an inductor with two entries, so it is two times x1 dot. Right? And for the voltage across the resistor, we have to find out what exactly the voltage across the resistor is. And we know by Ohm's law, V is equal to IR. So if, we, if I can figure out the current across that's flowing through the resistor, I can just multiply it by 1 and I will get the voltage. So what do we do to find the current? It is going to be I2 times R2, which is 1K. So I have to figure out what is I1 and I have to figure out what is I2. So now I have defined the current through the inductor to be x1. As we all know in series, current is not going to change. Elements in series will have the same current flowing through them. So the same current will flow through this, which means my I1 is the same as x1. So I'm just going to write x1 here, right? And what about I2? I have to figure out what is the current across this guy, uh, current flowing through this loop is, so that I can subtract it, so I'll get the net uh, voltage. I'll be able to get the voltage across this resistor. Now, Again, I'm going to go back to the energy storing element right here, right? It's just the capacitor. If I can figure out the current across this capacitor or the current flowing through this capacitor, I'll be able to find out the current through, flowing through this resistor as well in, with respect to this loop. So I'm going to go back to this equation right here. You can see the current flowing through a capacitor is simply C times dVc by dt. Fortunately for us, we define Vc to be a scale which means it is simply C times X2 dot that will give me the current. C here, in this case, is 3, which means I will have 3 times X2 dot to be the current. So I know the current flowing through this guy is 3 X2 dot, which means it's the same for this uh, resistor as well with respect to this particular loop. So I'm going to simply write I2 is nothing but 3 times X2 dot. And we know that R2 is simply 1 ohms, right? Very simple. So that's right there. So what I'm going to do is, sorry, this should be x1 dot. I'm going to leave it as it is because this equation has both x1 dot and x2 dot. I don't want that in my state space representation. Or to be precise, I don't really know how to represent it in state space because I only want x1 dot the particular line to have only elements on x1 and x2. I don't want any other derivatives, right? So I'm going to leave it as it is. Maybe I'll get some insight from loop 2. So I'm going to move on to loop 2 here, right? And I'm going to do the same. In this case, it's just that we don't have any sources, so everything is just an voltage drop, and we're going to equate it to 0. So in order to do that, I have to anyway consider this guy. In this case, you have to notice it's going to be the same voltage, but the direction is going to be different because I'm considering this loop first. So it will be I2 minus I1 times R, right, with respect to this loop. So I'm going to write that down, I2 minus I1 times R2, right. Um, let me trace back and correct this. This is R1 because I denoted it as R1. So this is, let me call this R2. R1. So we have this particular voltage, and then we have the voltage across this resistor, and the output voltage, and also the voltage across the capacitor. So how do I write this one? In here, we know that the voltage across this capacitor was defined to be a state. So I can simply write that as x2, right? I can simply write that as x2. Then, because that's just the voltage across the capacitor, I literally defined it to be a state. Now, coming back to this guy, I need to know the voltage across this resistor. I'm going to use the same technique here. If I know the current across 
this resistor, I can just use the Ohm's law. We already know the current across this uh, particular loop because we just calculated I2 in the previous case, which is 3 times x2 dot. So I'm just going to multiply it with R2, which also happens to be just 1 ohm. So I'm simply going to write it as plus VC uh, plus current across uh, voltage across this guy equal to I2 times R2, right? And then you have what? So in this case, you have y to be the output, but if you want to calculate the actual voltage, you can simply do the same thing, but just that it's going to be multiplied with 2, because the resistance is 2. If I can denote this as R3, for example, I can just write it as times R3 will be equal to 0, right? Correct? Now, I'm going to simply substitute stuff in. I know that I2 is 3 times x2 dot, right? Minus I1 was x1, because it's just what we defined it to be, the current across the inductor, times 1, plus x2 is going to be x2, plus what is I2? Same thing here, 3 times x2 dot times R2 is just 1, so nothing is going to change. Just that here, it's almost the same, but I have 2 ohms which means I'm going to have 6 times x2 dot equal to 0, right? So this is loop 2. Fortunately, as you can see, there are no x1 dots here in this equation. I only have x1, x2, and x2 dot, which means I can simply write this equation in terms of x2 dot. I can take all x2 dots to one side, right? So I can take out all x2 dots to one side. Let's see what we have here. We have 9, and then we have here 3. So that means it's going to be 12. So 12 x2 dot. I'm just taking all the x2 dots to one side. And then on the other side, I'm going to take all the x1s and x2s. So I have, uh, if I take it to the other side, I'm going to have plus x1 from here. And then I'm going to have minus x2. And that's it. Right? I can write this equation again as x2 dot is equal to 1 over 12 times x1 minus x2. I have a state equation, right? It's very clear. But now I have to come back here. I was not able to take everything to one side uh, with just x1 dot because I had x2 dot. So I'm simply going to substitute this guy over here, which will give me 2 times x1 dot plus x1 minus 3 times 1 over 12, so it will be just 1 over 4, times x1 minus x2, right? And then, if I now take x1 dot to one side and everything else to the other, just with simple, uh, simple algebra, I'll be able to end up with this. Minus 3 over 8 x1, minus 1 over 8 x2, plus 1 over 2 u. As you can see, I have x1, x2, and u. u will also go to the other side because I have u to the right hand side of the state space equation in general, right? Okay. So now, all I have to do is just stack it into a matrix form and I'll be pretty much done. So what I'm going to do is write the generic form. I need the state space representation. My state is a two-dimensional vector, x1 and x2, so x dot from here will simply be x1 dot and x2 dot. And then I have a matrix to fill, and then here it's going to be x1, x2, plus I have another uh, vector to fill. This u is simply u here. It's a scalar input in for our system, this particular system. So I will have a matrix uh, vector here to be filled will be column vector, and then I have the output equation, y is equal to, in our case, y is simply a scalar, so which means it's just 1 by 1, I will have a row vector, actually, times x1 minus x2, plus I will have one uh, just a scalar, because my output is also a scalar, and my input is also a scalar. I just need to fill in these values based upon these two equations. I'm going to call this 1, I'm going to call this 2. Based upon 1 and 2, I'll be able to fill these in. 
So let's look at x1 dot. How does x1 dot get affected in terms of x1? It's just minus 3 by 8. So I'm just going to pull, put in minus 3 by 8. My x2 has an effect based on minus 1 over 8. Minus 1 over 8. And then in terms of u, there seems to be an effect of half or 0.5. So that's there. Let's go on to x2 dot. Here, both x1 and x2 have 1 over 12, but just there is a minus here. So which means it is 1 over 12 for x1 and minus 1 over 12 for x2. There, there is no u here, which means u is not going to directly affect the evolution of x2. x2 dot does not directly depend on u. So I'm just going to plug in a 0 here. There is no effect. OK, coming back to this guy, my output equation. What is my output? My output is simply the voltage across this guy right here, which means I can simply write that as 0.5 or 1, 1 by 2 and minus 0.5. That is just the voltage right here. And I have no effect from the input. Right? All right. So with that, I have both my state equation, which is this, and my output equation, which is this. So this will be the A matrix, B matrix. In this case, it's a vector because I just have a scalar input, C matrix, and D matrix. And they're all filled. So this will be the final state space representation. This whole thing together is called the state space representation. All right, so we are going to look at this example now. As you can see, we have three loops, right? And we want the state space representation, basically. So we are going to fill these matrices in. So I'm just going to take these out so we can fill in the new numbers. So we have three loops, which does not really mean we have to have three states because there, are always, there is always a minimum number of states that you need to define a system. In this case, uh, kind of a quick guideline could be you have to look at the number of energy storing elements in your circuit. In this case, I have two capacitors and that's it. Everything else is just a resistor or a voltage source. Right? So in that case, you will only need two states. Right? You need not worry about why that is true, but it would be an interesting guideline to use, which will make things easy for you. Now, I have C1 and C2, which means two capacitors. We have, to, uh, we have talked about this in the previous case. We are going to have, in case of capacitors, the voltages to be the states. Right? So for that case, I'm going to have two states defined as x to be equal to the voltage across this capacitor right here, and then x2 could be the voltage across this capacitor, just that it's, the sign is going to be reversed because in the given problem, this sign was reversed. Right? So we are given, let's just assume we are given these state uh, variables, and then now we are going to think about how to define these different loop equations, and then from there, write the state space equation. So let's go with the first loop. Uh, in case of the first loop, I'm going to take this as the first loop. So I'm going to have the Vn, which is the source, on one side. That's pretty standard. And then I have two different voltage drops to think about. So now I just defined x1 to be the voltage across that capacitor. So it's simple. I'm just going to write it as x1. And then here, I have to find out the voltage across this resistor. I'm going to follow the same procedure. Just that I'm going to uh, find out the current from this loop, current from this loop, and then subtract them and multiply with the resistor. So just the ohm's law, V is equal to AR. So this is going to be multiplied by 2, because the resistance is 2, right here, 2 ohms. But I have to find the expression for the current across this guy and the current across this loop. Now, again, going back to the same technique, I have the capacitor here. So I can quickly look at this formula and know that the current across that capacitor is simply going to be C times dV by dt. If I know the current across the capacitor, I would know the current in this loop. Same thing for this capacitor. If I do the same thing, I'll be able to find the current for this loop. So, which will give me the, both, both the currents I need in order to perform my calculation. Now, what about this guy? The capacitance is just one, C is just one, 
the voltage was defined to be x1, which means it's just 1 times x1 dot, which is x1 dot. I'm just going to write x1 dot, which is the current across this loop or in this loop. What about this loop? It's going to be the same C, but the current is going to be in this direction. So if you notice the sign here, it's the opposite. So it's just going to be a minus of that, which means the current is going to be simply 1 times the VC by DT will be equal to minus x2 dot because of the sign change. If the sign was same as this guy, you won't have that problem because you have defined the current direction to be this. So you are negating this current and this current, basically. So you have to find out the expression for it. It's just one times the voltage divided by the time, or voltage taking the derivative of, uh, with respect to time. In this case, because of the sign change, it's going to be minus x2 dot. But we know that here, I'm going to already have a minus, so it's going to be minus of minus x2 dot. And then I will have a 2 here. Right? This minus comes from this definition. Here, right here. If it were to be defined otherwise, you would not have this minus of minus. You would simply just have minus of x to dot. Right? So that's important to remember. And that will be the first loop. In this case, as you can see, we have a similar problem like we had in the last problem. We have both x1 dot and x2 dot in this equation, which means you have to uh, get some information from the other loops in order to make this equation stand on its own. Now, moving on to the second loop. Let me consider this to be the second loop. There are three oldest drops. First one is easy. It is already x1, right? So I was it was defined to be x1, so that's fine. And what about the resistor? I need the current across this guy so that I can find the current across this guy. It's going to be the same. And then, so I can just simply multiply it with 5. So we just found out from, for this guy, it was x2 dot, right? It was simply minus x2 dot. So I'm going to write it as minus x2 dot times 5, which will give me minus 5 x2 dot. That is the voltage across this resistor. This minus, again, comes from the fact that there is a sign change. Otherwise, it would simply just be plus. And this voltage right here, because of the sign change, I'm going to simply write it as minus x2 is equal to 0, because there is no voltage source there. So x1 for this capacitor, minus 5, this is the R term, IR. So the I is nothing but x2 dot. We just calculated it in the previous case, because x2 dot is the current flowing through the capacitor. But you have a minus because of this uh, difference in sign. And then the same thing here, x2 was defined to be minus Vc2, so it's just going to be minus x2. Okay. So that's there. This equation looks promising because it only has x2 dot. So what I'm going to do is simply write x2 dot is equal to, let me take x2 to the other side. So I will have 5x2 dot is equal to x1 minus x2 which means x2 dot is simply going to be 1 over 5 times x1 minus x2. Right there, right? So that's that. So moving on to loop 3. Now, for loop 3, what I can do is I can equate everything. There is no source, so I can equate everything to 0. I need to find the voltage drops across these guys. So the obvious voltage drop is, in this case, V out and I have this capacitor here, so I need to know the voltage uh, uh, across this capacitor and then I need to know the voltage uh, across, voltage drop across this guy, right? And R1 is simply 2. So. Let me write the voltage across this one. It's simply this is going to be x2. But minus x2 because I'm dealing with the opposite sign here. And now this again, I just need to know the current, and then hence I, I will be able to calculate the voltage across this guy. 
So it is going to be simply two, this current minus this current times 2. So what you can do is, and write it as plus, what about you can just take care of this guy. You can take it from, sorry, here, the loop 1, because you already dealt with the particular voltage drop there. But just that it's going to be reversed now. You're going to have x2 dot minus minus x2 dot minus x1 dot, right? Let me write this a little clearer. Plus minus x2 dot, which is the current across this loop, and minus the current across this loop is x1 dot times 2, just like the previous problem, because you already dealt with it, you don't have to do any new calculations, equal to 0, right? Now, both these have x2 dots in them, so I can substitute x2 dot, let's just say from here, and then I will be able to get the n is equal to x1 plus x1 dot plus 1 over 5 times x1 minus x2, the whole thing multiplied by 2, right? Or the other way around, I could do x2 dot substitution here, which will be b out minus x2 plus I can take out the minus outside and in the, instead of x2 dot I can write 1 over 5 x1 minus x2 minus x1 dot times 2 is equal to 0. Right? Is that clear? Now, I have three equations here but I only need two out of them. But I want to somehow combine x1, x1 dot, x2 dot, and v in and v out. So I will be able to write it in terms of the final equations. So x2 dot is pretty simple, right? x2 dot, you don't really have to worry about it because it's simply half times x1 minus x2. So I can just fill them right away. So I can forget about that once I do that. So this is just 0.5, oh sorry, 0.2, 1 over 5 is 0.2 and I have minus 0.2. So no influence from the input, right? So I can simply write x2 dot equation, so that's out of the way, so you're done with that. Now, what about v out? How can you write v out? You can write v out like as, let me write it here separately. You can write v out as, x1 minus x1 plus x2 plus v in. So this is the voltage across this guy. So this expression could simply be derived using this equation right here. So this and this equation. So you will be able to get an expression for vr. If you take all of this to one side and substitute x2 from this expression, in this case, you can take all of x1 dot to one side, and then you will be able to substitute. So let's do that quickly. So if I did x1 dot here, right, able to find that, you will see, you'll get, after simplification, you'll get minus 0.7x1. This is just some algebra that I'm skipping through. Plus 0.2 times x2. Plus... 0.5 times v in. Right? Now, if I take this x1 dot equation and plug it in here, I'll be able to get v out. What is v out? Because I'm interested in finding the y equation. It will turn out v out is simply minus x1 plus x2 plus v in. How can I write that in terms of this matrix? So before we do that, let's finish with x1 dot. So I just have to simply plug this in, in terms of the matrix equation. So x1 is minus 0.7, x2 is 0.2, and the n contributes with 0.5.
So my system equation is done. What about my output equation? So we can, we, I just said we could derive v out to be this guy, which means x1 is simply minus 1, x2 is 1, and then the in is simply 1 again. So we'll have 1 here. And in our case, u is nothing but v in. OK. To kind of recap, what we did here for this problem was we had three loops, and we had the state definitions, and then we went to three different loop equations. So loop 2 was particularly pretty easy because we directly got x2 dot in terms of x1 and x2. So we were able to go ahead and just write down the state space equation. But in terms of loop 1 and loop 3, we had to do some substitutions in the sense that you needed to substitute x2 dot from this equation right here because you don't need x1 and x2 dot in the same equation. So you got this and then from here, you were able to get x1 dot to one side and everything else to the other side, which gives us the next state equation. So you can go ahead and fold the elements of the matrix accordingly. And then here, we have this v out. So we need to figure out what is v out, right? And one simple way of doing it is simply substituting this expression of x1 dot into this x1 dot right here. And then we can have v out on one side and pull everything to the other. If you do that and do the simplifications, you will simply end up with this right here. So which gives you V out in terms of X1, X2, and the input, the in, which is what you need for the final element of your state space, which is the output equation. So you have Y is equal to this particular C matrix times your state, which is your X1 and X2, plus D times V in. In this case, we have all the elements to be non-zero, as you can see, because your output actually directly depends on your input, too. So you have minus 1 and 1, and then finally 1 for Vn. So that will be the total state space representation. These two equations together are called state space equations.